Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities. And I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang. And joining me, as always, is Bernie Ryan, DJ Star Watcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, hi, Sarah. Very good. Always lovely to see you. Yes. Bernie is our professor of the Astronomy Lab here at USM and the protector of the night skies, and also the author of the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. Reach out to us at WMPG, scientifically speaking, at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG SciSpeak if you want to uh, uh, peruse any of the memes that I share on Twitter. I don't really share that many memes, actually. Uh, Bernie, what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Okay, good. I'm glad you asked. Um, so people might remember what the 21st is. This is the exact anniversary almost to the hour uh, three years ago. Um, I don't know if you remember where you were or what you have seen, but that would be the total solar eclipse. Now, most of you were probably in Maine, and um, you saw about 60% of it. I think it was clear for most of the state. Uh, however, Sarah and myself, um, Sarah went to Illinois and I drove all the way to Idaho. We actually saw the total solar eclipse part. It's called the Great American Total Solar Eclipse. It was only visible. We're so cool. Yeah, it, it started in Oregon and it covered 12 states and ended up in South Carolina. It had a very narrow path, only about 70 miles wide. And you had to be in the middle part, like within less than 10 miles of that 70 wide mile path to actually see the shadow of the moon race over you. So that's the first one that either one of us had seen. And um, I was lucky to also go to some national parks like Yellowstone and Rocky Mountain and Badlands and everything. But um, so this is exactly three years ago. And another reasoning I'm mentioning this, of course, is that in less than four years, there'll be one passing right over Maine. It'll actually kind of make an X. If you took the one we had three years ago, and there's a spot in the middle in southern Illinois called Carbondale. That's the middle of the X. That will see another eclipse in less than four years. And the one in four years will start in Mexico and end up in Maine and also go through a little bit of Canada. So that's coming So it's up. like the opposite. Yeah, it's like an opposite X, but the fact that Carbondale, Illinois will have two in less than seven years is pretty neat. That's yeah. rare. There's it's crazy, place. yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, I mean, literally it was three years. I did, it's been so long. It yeah, doesn't feel years. like it's been that long ago. And yeah, I remember yeah. then it was like, oh, we gotta wait seven years to see it um, yeah. here in Maine, so. Yeah, because where I was out west, it's not too early to start planning if you have a specific site in mind or something. There was, uh, we went up a ski mountain the day before the eclipse out in, um, I guess, close to the Grand Tetons. And to be on top of that mountain to see it, a person had to uh, set that up uh, seven years ahead of time for the for the 20 Wow. And then, of course, they could watch the shadow for much longer. I was pretty lucky. I was on a high plateau and I could see the shadow coming, but it's 2,000 miles an hour. And I wasn't up at 13,000 feet like they were. I was probably up around 6,000 feet. So they had a much better view and, you know, they could, it's worth planning every little detail and all the equipment and the drones and anything else you had. I only had one camera. I may have two or three cameras for the next one. So, you know, that type of thing. So you should be aware of that. Um, okay. So um, on the 18th, we actually had an interesting new moon. It's not just the regular new moon. It's not an eclipse season, so it didn't cause the eclipse. However, it was called a black moon. So I don't know if you had heard of that, but it's similar to a blue moon in a way. But the black moon is the third new moon in a season of four new moons, which originally was the term for what a, for the, what a blue moon meant too for the full moon part of it. And now the blue moon is pretty much just two full moons in a month. So then it would have to be like about the first and the 31st. But the black moon that we just had on the 18th is the third in a season of four. Of course, the season has three months and normally you wouldn't get four of those. So we have four of them for this season. So that's the black moon. So similar to like the micro moon and the super moon. The super moon everyone knows is the full moon within one day of uh, perigee closest to us. So it's physically about 7% bigger. But then the opposite end is the micro moon within a day of apogee furthest away. And that's about 7% smaller than the average full moon would be. Even though they always look big when they're full moon. So that's an interesting thing that just happened uh, a few years ago. And actually another thing that actually ties into math and numbers, which is kind of interesting. So you've heard the term obviously once in a blue moon and you think, you know, that might be 10 years or whatever. It's, it's actually every 2.71 years on the average. And you can even have two in one year if you have like a leap year because then February is too short. But it's about every 2.71 years. 
And if you know numbers, that's actually the natural log. If you wear that. Wow. Yeah, so like, you know, compound interest, population growth, all the reasons you would use ln to the x, that's the natural log is 2.71. So I don't know if that's wow. a coincidence, but that's about how <laughs> often uh, you get two moons in a month. It's probably a coincidence because the, the 12 months of the year is a man-made thing. It's not a natural. It's obviously, a year is us going around the sun, so that's natural. But the 12 month isn't, so the 2.7 years. But it happened to be the natural log. So that's kind of neat. So now you know how a blue moon occurs. Um, okay, so other things to see. The sky is pretty much the same. Jupiter and Saturn are up. They're pretty close together, maybe eight, seven or eight degrees. I, I see them every night when I go out. There were quite a few meteors last week. Didn't see any recently. So they're close, but you should be aware that they're getting closer. Uh, they're still both in retrograde. They're going to stop in about a month and go back to their normal eastward motion. However, in December, and I know that's still a few months off, but they're going to have the closest conjunction in over 400 years. Whoa. Literally less than like a tenth of a degree apart. Visible in the same big eyepiece in a telescope. They could have been the version of what the Christmas star was 2,000 years ago. But they want a really amazing close conjunction. You'll see that happening throughout the next several months. So be aware of that. Jupiter, of course, is closer and moves faster. Saturn is further away and moves slower. So it's not going to move as much in the sky. So it's going to look like Jupiter will be catching up with Saturn over the next three months. So start looking for that. It won't probably won't be obvious for a few more weeks. Now, Mars is getting up earlier and earlier. It's probably up well before 10, 10 o'clock at night. It'll be at its best um, in October, early October opposition. That's when it comes up at sunset. And then if you're up early or stay up late, you can see Venus coming up about 3 and it's going to be the same pretty much for the whole month. The way Venus and the Earth are moving right now, it the net result is Venus always comes up around 3 o'clock right now, because that's going to change in a few weeks. Um, so there's your planets, and there's the... Just curious, um, yeah. I, I don't know if you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. What is, when are Jupiter and Saturn going to be the closest together? Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, good point. Uh, Christmas Day, the winter solstice, just before Christmas. Wow. December 21st. That seems so That'd coincidental. Be an interesting solstice with that very rare for once in a 400 year conjunction then wow so, yeah good point awesome yes. thank you bernie you're welcome and if bernie talked way too fast you can also check out the monthly what's up column in the portland press herald to read all of these astronomical goodies so today's episode we had kind of thought that you know with all the talk about masks and all of the face coverings that we have to wear because of coronavirus, we thought it might be interesting to talk about filtration, air filtration, particle filtration, um, and do just a little apolitical dive into how, we, how these were made and the history of them. So Bernie, I thought maybe you could start off yeah. um, by giving us kind of a brief little intro to like air quality and the HEPA air filters. Well, basically um, what I looked into was the uh, the HEPA filters. Everyone's probably heard of them, but maybe doesn't know exactly what it stands for. Um, I know I was, there's a person, if you know, if you have any kind of allergies or anything, asthma, you want to use that type of filter for your vacuum cleaners. And so that just stands for high efficiency particulate air or absorbing uh, filters, HEPA. So they're good because they can uh, capture much smaller particles. In that case, it would be just dust particles because the virus is even smaller, but it would slow them down. So down to 0.3 microns. So actually a micron, if you're not sure of the, the metric system, that is a millionth of a meter. So it's very small. And just to give you an idea how small, the human eye can probably see something down to 40 microns. So it's much smaller than anything you could see. The width of a human hair is about 50 microns or 50 millionth of a meter. Uh, white blood cells, which of course you need a microscope to see, they're about 25 microns. And then red blood cells are even smaller, just 7 or 8 microns. Bacteria, which are all, all around, of course, all the time, they're about 2 microns, so obviously it would stop them. And then the coronavirus, in, in general, is about 0 0.1 microns. So that would be smaller than what even a HEPA filter can actually capture. Yeah. It would obviously slow it down, and it would be good to have that kind of a filter for that. So one thing to note is that I, I thought it was interesting. So Google searches for surgical masks peaked at the end of March um, in the U.S. What's important to understand about filtration 
is that the the HEPA air filters that you are talking about, um, they not only do they rely on the material itself, um, but they also rely on kind of the structure that it's made. So they're typically pleated. It's kind of like the cabin filters in your car, the oil filters in your car, they're pleated. Um, and so the material is kind of like folded over and over and over again, increasing surface area and increasing its ability to filter out um, particles that you don't want going into whatever system that it's filtering from. So I kind of was taking a look at surgical masks primarily. So there is a guy who is uh, a medical mask historian, which is apparently a thing. And his name is Christos Linteris, and he's a lecturer of social anthropology at the University of St. Andrews. And um, his, his history kind of, you know, focuses on Europe, um, but he cites a lot of paintings like from the Renaissance, um, some medieval paintings, I, I think, that show people with kind of cloth around their faces, um, seemingly to avoid illnesses, um, where these paintings are kind of depicting people uh, dealing with the dead um, or caring for sick people during various, you know, diseases that kind of went around um, during those times. Um, and so there... <laughs> and so... I don't know what that was. Um, <laughs> and so um, they depicted these uh, like cloth around their faces, um, which seemed to be like they were avoiding illness, um, kind of like how we wear surgical masks today. But um, he actually notes that this was primarily to avoid smell rather than to prevent transmission, mm. yeah. um, which makes sense. And yes. so he cites that miasma um, is kind of the go-to explanation of the source of kind of how gases would come from the ground and that that was how diseases spread. Um, so this was in Europe, uh, they believed that smell caused disease, which I guess in some ways makes sense, right? I mean, you yeah. smell bad food and you, you think, oh, it's bad, so I'm not gonna go near it. Um, and so I think probably a very similar concept. And so the initial surgical mask in the West, um, this was recorded in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, and it's kind of similar to what we see on some people today who kind of take a handkerchief and they tie it around their heads. Um, so that was kind of the first uh, uh, version of the surgical mask. Mm -hmm. And their purpose was primarily to prevent, you know, if you're, you're uh, doing surgery on somebody, you don't want to like cough and then mm -hmm. cough your gross spit <laughs> into wounds, open wounds. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so then that, uh, that mask was then iterated upon. And um, during uh, sometime in the early 1900s, uh, the Manchurian plague, there was a plague in Manchuria um, that was going around and was killing a lot of people. And, um, and so I think the Chinese had uh, kind of requested this Malaysian doctor named uh, Wu Lianda who um, he, they, they asked him to kind of come and, you know, do figure out how to solve everything, <laughs> uh, yeah, everything. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Um, and so he, he had conducted autopsies on um, victims of that plague that broke out in Manchuria. And he had suspected um, that the plague could have been uh, spread through the air, um, just kind of based on, you know, how these uh, people were, you know, where the disease manifested in their bodies. And so he had developed a mask uh, made from several layers of gauze and cotton. And it's very similar to, you know, the, the loops around the ears covering the, the mouth and the, the, the nose. Mm -hmm. So he developed this mask and it's like super thick, you know, think of like a diaper on your face. <laughs> and <laughs> he was kind of attacked both like racially and like intellectually from a lot of European doctors and especially French doctors who said, oh, why would we ever like wear this invention by, you know, insert any racist remarks. <laughs> and, um, and so it, it actually backfired on uh, this one particular French doctor who tried to prove Dr. Wu wrong 
and he essentially went into a hospital of plague uh, victims uh -oh. and died in two days because he didn't wear a mask. And so from then, doctors thought, oh, okay, maybe, maybe there's some truth to this. And so they started to develop their own masks, you know, think of diving masks, think of any kind of iteration of a mask that you can think of, but his still won out because it had all these layers that protected the user or the, the um, caretakers, the clinicians from ultimately bacteria. That is kind of the predecessor to the modern mask. It's essentially a bunch of cloth uh, multiple layers of it and you know with more layers you have more chances of catching things as they mm -hmm. as they move through the layers and they get stuck so the n95 mask bernie had you heard of the n95 mask before this year uh not before this year no not really um, so the N95 mask is a child of uh, Dr. Wu's original design of the multi-layers of uh, cotton and gauze. And so war, World War I, World War II, really pushed scientists to invent air filtering um, masks because of all of the basically industry that was happening. Um, especially like in the mining industry, there's, you know, all the black lung stuff. And so they kind of thought that maybe this mask could help keep people able to continue working in horrible conditions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it's also because, you know, on the, in the battlefield, there is just a lot of particles, there's a lot of dust and, you know, you don't want your soldiers coughing and not being able to, fight for you. Um, so among a lot of things, there's many reasons why masks um, and dust masks started to come to be. Um, so some of the first masks uh, that were invented for these purposes were made of fiberglass. Um, they were really bulky. They made breathing really difficult. And so as kind of innovation and technology developed, um, actually 3M's gift wrap division, uh, they, uh, they wanted to create stiffer ribbons. And so there, there is a woman named Sarah Little Turnbull who helped to push kind of the, the division to experiment with melted polymers and air blasting melted polymers into kind of fabrics, uh, a fabric of tiny fibers. Um, and so this is kind of the modern version of melt blown uh, fabric. And so when um, she, she had kind of lost a lot of loved ones due to various sicknesses, and she, for some reason, took inspiration from a bra cup to create a bubble-shaped surgical mask. Hmm. Um, and I don't know why this inspired her, uh, but uh, something with kind of maybe seeing the mask uh, from the doctors. And anyway, so uh, she uh, it kind of helped th move this along. And um, this bubble-shaped mask was initially branded to blackout dust um, and is and ended up being kind of the single use N95 dust respirator that was developed by 3M in 1972. So that's kind of the short uh, compact version of that history. Um, so the fibers in these masks, they have, you know, they're, they're woven, you know, they're not knit, but they're just kind of laid down and then melted together. Um, and so, you know, heat, uh, it, this is essentially plastic and it's bonded together by uh, heat and kind of other, um, I guess solvents, I'm not sure exactly, but we'll say heat primarily. Um, and so uh, it, it has a lot of big holes. Um, and like we were talking about with the filters, you know, the longer you, have the filters in for, the longer you wear the mask, the more efficient it is at actually filtering out particles because there's more particles to filter out more particles, which filters out more particles, um, which essentially means it captures more particles. And so um, more particles being filtered out uh, also makes breathing really difficult because now you have a lot of particles that are blocking all of the holes that uh, and originally allowed air to pass through. So technically, the mask really shouldn't be worn for more than eight hours. Um, there's actually this guy who um, did a study. He would like wear the mask and kind of bike around really polluted areas. 
Um, and he kind of showed that, I mean, I, his, his work is not published, which is why I didn't really want to share it as, um, you know, uh, evidence, if you will. But what he showed was that um, you could wear this mask in N95 for up to 20 days, and it is still very effective because it's still filtering um, all the particles out. So it's it, it's hard to breathe, um, and it's really dirty, but it's still effective at filtering. Um, so, but we don't really want that. You know, at the at the end of 20 days, it was a black mask. Um, so. <laughs> Um, so anyways, um, this is where we come to uh, Peter Tsai. And so he's a material scientist and an engineer who worked in nonwoven fa fabrics. So nonwoven fabrics are essentially, you know, they're, they're not woven, they're not knitted. Um, it's a fabric-like material made from fibers that are bonded together by chemical, mechanical, heat means. Um, and they're flat, porous sheets, uh, and they're essentially like melted plastics, like we, we've kind of talked about. Tyvek, Kevlar, those are all non-woven fabrics. They're engineered for specific functions. Um, a lot of fabrics, uh, like, you know, they're made for filters um, that we've talked about. Coffee, tea, a lot of those are non-woven fabrics. Diaper products, packaging, um, you know, vacuum bags, et cetera. They're all, most of those are now, uh, the modern versions are non-woven fabrics. Um, so N95s. Uh, N stands for not resistant to oil, and 95 stands for the ability to remove at least 95% of submicron particles, dust, haze, smoke, influenza. So the modern N95 from 3M is made from four plies of polypropylene. The first uh, barrier, this is the same as surgical mask, is moisture resistant. Um, the second and third barrier, not the same as surgical mask, is this double ply filtration. The fourth layer is just comfort for contact with skin. And the efficiency of this particular mask, which is what Peter is credited for inventing, is that the middle two layers, uh, the filtration layer, is um, electrostatically charged. The fibers are electrostatically charged. It imparts an electric charge onto the fibers. And that means that it kind of attracts uh, particles to that, um, that filter so that it doesn't say go around and towards your mouth um, because you're already breathing it in. And so it's just trying to target it towards the filter rather than elsewhere. Um, and so it can absorb and capture a lot of microorganisms like bacteria and like viruses. And so uh, the last piece of this that I wanted to mention was uh, the sterilization. So because they were in such short supply, supply chains were so messed up here. Um, especially. And that made it so that these originally designed to be disposable had to be reused and we had to figure out how to reuse them. And so many hospitals, many uh, schools, a lot of them did a lot of research and experimentation. And um, several teams around the, around the globe have looked into kind of really cheap, accessible ways of sterilizing N95 masks. And um, I'll list a couple so in February, um, in Taiwan, there, uh, one of the univers medical universities there, they uh, found that dry steaming the surgical mass for several minutes had a sterilizing effect. Um, in Ohio, some scientists there, I don't know where, uh, they showed in April that uh, steaming mass in rice cookers could be effective. Yeah, I just heard that today from a, a computer scientist from Taiwan. He okay. Yeah. Rice cookers. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's actually in line with CDC guidance uh, that yeah. moist heat is possibly effective at decontamination. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure why, like moist heat, um, but uh, there's there's there are more kind of accessible ways of sterilizing. Um, there was a study published in Environmental Science and Technology where um, Dr. Nguyen who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at University of Illinois, uh, UIUC. Um, they looked at using dry heat to decontaminate a 95 mass with a, this is very specific, a Faberware, Faberware multifunction pressure cooker. Uh, so that retails about $50. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> so they put mass, uh, a used mask in there. 
and they found that they were able to inactivate the virus without negatively affecting the mask fit or filtration ability. Hmm. And also uh, a key point was not leaving behind some kind of chemical residue. Hmm. Um, so there, what they did was they did a 50 minutes cooking cycle um, at a temperature of 212 degrees. And uh, with that, I believe they were able to inactivate the virus by 99.9%, which is the level required by FDA to consider something as sterilized. Um, and then, or maybe decontaminated. I'm not sure if there's a difference there. Um, and then they also did also 20 cycles of dry heat. I'm not sure. Um, I think that was just another way of experimenting. And they also found no significant difference in filtration efficiency. Um, and then from the man himself, Dr. Sai, who is the designer of the modern day N95 mask, um, he, uh, he and then guidelines from the CDC suggest do not use alcohol or wash with soapy water. And um, th so they showed kind of the reduction in filtration efficiency, where if your starting filtration efficiency of a mask was 93.2%, if you immersed it in medical alcohol, it dropped to 67%. Oh. If you saturate it with isopropyl al alcohol vapor, it drops to 47.4%. And if you wash it by hand with soap or water mm -hmm. for two minutes, it drops to 54%. Um, so alcohol and water, they break down the electrostatic charge of N95 masks and that's the key to how they filter out small particles. Um, and so if that reduces the effectiveness by a third or half, you should not do it. Mm -hmm. So he suggested three ways, uh, three uh, home ways to decontaminate um, or sterilize. Um, one is by rotating masks. Uh, you can have four masks or you know multiple masks. And if you just let them rest for 72 hours before you wear them again, um, it should kill and desiccate the, the viruses. Um, the second one is you can steam or boil it in 260 degrees Fahrenheit um, for three minutes and that can disinfect the mask, but don't stir it. Um, obviously don't do this if your layers are made of paper. And then the third option is to bake at 160 Fahrenheit for 30 minutes in a non-food oven. It was very clear, made very clear. Do not use this in your regular oven where you make all your casseroles. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I just thought that that, uh, hopefully was kind of helpful. Um, you know, kind of a primer on N95s, on, uh, general surgical masks. Um, surgical masks, they can really vary in their, uh, filtration efficiency. Some are as low as like 40 to 60% and others can be as high as say 90, 90% or so. Um, it's really hard to tell, I think at home. Um, how effective or, you know, how good of a quality your masks are. Um, but just know that. And um, I don't know anything about cloth masks, but, uh, you know, the, the holes are very big there. So they're not quite as effective. But, you know, if they can stop you from spitting um, <laughs> all of your spit everywhere, uh, it is somewhat helpful. Um, so that's our breakdown of filters and, and masks. Um, and we hope that that was kind of helpful. There's a lot of information. <laughs> yeah. Listen to it again. Um, yeah, that'll be good because we might be wearing these for a long time. So at least yeah. vaccine. Yeah. And a lot of people I talk to won't take the vaccine. So they probably should still be doing the masks and the distancing and all that. So yeah, no, it's a good point. Um, yeah. Because if we look at kind of the timeline of how long it took to develop vaccines of other um, diseases and viruses, yeah. uh, the average is about seven years. So, you know, it could be super fast, but it could be a really long time. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> the Russians claim they already have one, but I wouldn't trust that. <laughs> it might be less than 50% effective and it's almost better not to have one. Yeah. 50-50 chance. Yeah. You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself, Bernie. Br myself and Bernie. <laughs> That's it. Uh, stay tuned for songs <laughs> from Mother Russia and her neighboring countries with our tour on Suzuki Dusi. From your favorite nerds, we wish you safe viewing and clear skies. <laughs>